Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Pereira. Last week, the U.S. fired 59 Tomahawk cruise missiles at an airbase in Homs province in response to an alleged chemical weapons attack against Syrians, civilians in Idlib province on April 4th. The Syrian foreign minister denied the government's involvement in the Idlib incident, saying that it had never nor would it ever use chemical weapons on either civilians or terrorists operating in the country. The Russian foreign ministry said that the United States' missile strike is an act of aggression that violates international law and bolsters terrorists. Iran and Russia, along with other allies, issued a joint statement under a so-called Joint Command Center that also said that U.S. attack had crossed a red line and added that they will respond to any aggression. On this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyze the U.S.'s fresh streak of aggression in West Asia and also in Afghanistan. Joining me on the program today are Wail Awad, West Asia expert Shiv Shankar Mukherjee, former diplomat, A.K. Ramakrishnan, Professor, Center for West Asian Studies, JNU, and Alok Bansal, Director, India Foundation. Ambassador Mukherjee, I'd like to begin with you, of course. We've all been trying to comprehend what really happened in Syria. There are several theories doing the rounds, several uh, people saying different things, of course. What exactly happened in Syria? Why the sudden turn of events? Well, you're right in one sense. In the kind of conflict that we are seeing in uh, the Middle East, especially in Syria, the first casualty is usually the truth. So we'll, uh, I doubt if we'll ever know exactly what went on over there, but the evidence, uh, you know, that has been presented to the world is a series of images of uh, people dying of a chemical attack, of children, babies dying of a chemical attack. Uh, the, the West uh, says that there's, there's uh, evidence of, of from, from uh, quarters that are including journalists and NGOs that are covering the conflict and who were there. The Russians say that uh, this was certainly not the case. This was probably chemicals, uh, chemical weapons stored by the rebel groups which are fighting the regime in Syria. And the Syrian president says, uh, the Syrian government says that they had absolutely nothing to do with it, that they had given up their entire stock of chemical weapons uh, once the deal was struck with the UN. So, as I said, uh, I don't know uh, what, what uh, you know, the truth is, and I doubt if the world knows. The, it, the world will believe what it chooses to believe depending on who you are and sure. where you are. Indeed. Uh, as far as the action is concerned, I think, uh, well, d disregarding, disregarding reports such as that uh, Ivanka Trump persuaded her father to launch the attack. Uh, it has been welcomed by those who are fi fighting against the Syrian regime. It has been welcomed by countries like Turkey. Uh, the rebel groups uh, have welcomed it. But frankly, it, if you, it, it, is, it, is, it cannot be described as some huge military strike that has uh, at all weakened the uh, fighting ability of the Syrian regime. I mean, that airport, 59 missiles sounds uh, terrific, but it actually isn't. It didn't even hurt the runways. Two days after the attack, the uh, airport was fully functional. But symbolically, I think uh, the president of America hopes that it will send a strong signal sure. that there are lines that uh, cannot be crossed. Fair enough. Uh, my final thought is that I think Donald Trump being what he is, uh, you know, the, the kind of image that he wants to, to show, it, uh, the last two years has seen America marginalized in the Syrian theater and Russia in the forefront. So perhaps uh, a, a kind of feeling that it's time America uh, walk back into the theater as a major player rather than be marginalized, you know, uh, and not be even part of important meetings like the Russians just held with uh, Iran right. um, and, and Turkey. It's so short, fair enough. It, it's a combination of motives like that. It's got him some PR. It's got him some PR kudos, but I doubt if it's done anything to shorten the war or or anything like that. Okay, fair enough, Professor. Let me bring you in now. You know, is that what it is at the end of the day? Symbolism and posturing, because like the ambassador pointed out, it's not done too much damage in Syria. Even the bomb dropped in Afghanistan. Of course, it was a 22,000-pound bomb, but it didn't do too much damage as far as the, you know the ground itself is concerned. There are. Two, three things there. The first one is the uh, importance that Russia was gaining 
in, West, in the West Asian region um, over a period of time. Um, as the ambassador has mentioned, it was not part of uh, uh, the talks with uh, Turkey and other players. Um, the attack, the use of the missiles, have uh, placed the United States again as an important uh, part of what's going on there. It was taking a back seat until quite recently. And uh, that was what was expected uh, of Trump in his presidency because he was uh, trying to focus on the United States, the America First slogan and so on. Um, but once he became president, he, he thought that this is uh, something that is very important. So there is, he said uh, that his policy on Syria uh, has changed fundamentally. Um, and, and he is using this as an opportunity uh, to pacify the American allies, traditional allies, like Turkey, and like Saudi Arabia. And possibly some voices in America also. Voices in America. But that also creates some kind of problems with the, uh, you know, some part of the Republicans who were supporting him because they want all the attention to be focused internally. So uh, there are these things that um, the balancing act in West Asia, pacifying American friends within the West Asian region. And obviously, you know, by sending that signal to Bashar al-Assad, uh, he hopes to, to play this card with Russia, which again, has another meaning for him because of the, during the presidential election, the Russian involvement in American elections, etc. that was becoming a murky affair, and it still is, but he could at least divert, uh, the, attention divert the attention from that as well. Alok Mansal, is that what's happening? Is, you know, is something that is happening behind the scenes that we can't comprehend at this point in time? And, you know, all this bonhomie that was being spoken about during the presidential election and also after that, of course, once Trump swore in as well, there was a lot of flack that he had to take that he was in cahoots with the Russian President Putin. So is, that, is this a game that Putin and Trump are playing? I think if you look at it, the candidate Trump and President Trump, especially on the foreign policy front, appear to be two different individuals. In fact, the way he has acted in uh, Syria... Uh, where he had a different viewpoint while he was campaigning, I think shows that he's trying to pacify certain sections of American domestic opinion and some of their allies who have not been in agreement with him. The second fact which comes very clearly to mind is, I think he's one person who's going to use a sledgehammer to kill a fly. And I think this is what he tried to do uh, in Syria as well as in Afghanistan where he used uh, GBU-43B uh, as far as impact is concerned, uh, both the incidents are quite different. I think uh, in Syria, it was just to indicate to the people that he's capable of striking. And I think that was one first, his first big military action. And he wanted to give a signal, I think, probably to his domestic audience and to his allies that he's capable of acting big. That didn't have any impact, actually, militarily, except killing certain, unfortunately, certain civilians. But on the other hand, I think uh, the Afghanistan bomb, uh, I think, did kill 36 uh, ISIS uh, people. And uh, to my mind, it was, I think, a very, very significant and a positive development because it indicated two things. One is that U.S. resolve that is willing to go to any extent as far as supporting the Afghan regime is concerned. And I think uh, that probably gives a signal to others. The second, uh, another issue which is very important is that both these events, are also a signaling to Russians, to Putin, because he has been accused to be an ally. And I think uh, on these, both these events, I think he's sending certain signaling to Russians as well as to uh, their other allies, I think Iranians, with, against whom he has taken a very, very strong line. And he's trying to tell that, yes, we are willing to operate here. In fact, we are going to be deployed very big. In fact, uh, in Syria, the possibility of a conflict between powers like Russia and America also exist because this sort of an event can any time lead to retaliation. Supposing certain action is taken and you have Russian troops or something. So this is a danger that has actually become very, very manifest today that there is a feasibility of this 
conflict further spiraling out of control. Sure, sure. Why, Lavad, is that what's going to happen? I mean, because the Russians have been, you know, furious with what happened as far as the airstrikes on the airstrip in, in Syria is concerned. And, you know, they've said that we are going to take strict action towards if America aggresses further. So do you believe that this particular issue is only going to further escalate? Well, I think if that is what the American administration wanted to see, there is an escalation. We are heading for not from a regional war, maybe of a third world war. Because if you look at the, uh, the, uh, the statements coming from the White House, you will find out that they are ready for a preemptive strike on North Korea. They are ready to expand the war on Syria. They are ready to go to Afghanistan again. So is that is a really fighting terrorism? Or are you really bringing peace and security to the international community? Or you are really dragging into a, a kind of a Cold War se se uh, session of we are seeing this uh, new era in, in this part of the world? What I feel that the Trump administration, or Trump himself, he has now become stronger than Hillary Clinton time because Hillary Clinton had a problem with the establishment there in the U.S. and that is why she was pulled out. That's why they prompted Trump where he is now hijacked even the, the right wing people within the, uh, the U.S. administration that they are now siding with him. So he is more dangerous than any American president because the previous legacy of Obama have bombed Syria 12,542 times. And now he is they continue with the legacy of the Obama, and he is attacking the first time illegally, unilaterally, without even the UN Security Council resolution, attacking a, a sovereign nation without any invest, proper investigation to who did the job, irrespective of who did the job. Both are condemnable. It is condemnable it, to kill civilian. It is condemnable also to do a unilateral act by aggressing, uh, aggressive uh, um, move that he is, has been carried out. So I think. Uh, uh, I don't see him really going for peace. I may see him more in the coming days or maybe in a year to come that he'll be impeached by the American administration. He will not continue in office. I can, I can feel it because the way this man is behaving is not behaving in a normal sense. And that is more dangerous in the current scenario. Because if you're talking of preemptive strike on North Korea, then you are trying to give a message from this bombing of Afghanistan. You want to tell me that you killed 36 Daesh. You are using a bomb of 11,000 ton of, 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 of explosive, of TNT and aluminum in it, and you are attacking to kill 36 of them. While Tora Bora was when we were there and we were watching how they were running after Osama bin Laden, they never used it. Why now? There is a, there is a military message on this. War. So first, that the United States changed its military doctrine. A military doctrine from being in like the you know, cycle of the American, losing American in Vietnam or in Afghanistan or in Iraq. Now they don't have boot on the ground. They can use a drone culture, and they can use bomb to reduce the amount of American loss of life. While nobody talk of 100,000 Afghani civilians living in that Nanghar. Where is the people there? Do we know how many people died? Why they have used this bomb? So many questions are about to be arise because this kind of bomb, usually in military perspective, it is meant for a total infrastructure built inside the territory where you want it to penetrate and uh, cause the maximum damage to the infrastructure underground. That is only in North Korea or in Iran. So is that is the way you are provoking nations to make more legitimacy for having a deterrence, not ra rather than going and dismantling or disarming these nations? I think the message is quite dangerous. The world is heading for more of a, a new world order, where okay. we might find that the United States is trying to prove to the world that it's still the unipolar uh, power in this world, which is not likely to be, because other nations will step in. And I think that will be, we will see the follow-up on the Syrian attack or on, on on Afghanistan, what will be the follow-up on these issues? And that's where we have to watch and see. Fair enough. Ambassador Mukherjee, I want to bring you in now. You know, uh, it's after continuously or repeatedly talking about looking inwards, putting America first, American people first, suddenly Trump has taken a U-turn and has decided to be this big power on the world stage. What has changed over the last three months from January to April? Well, one thing that has changed from January, well, progressively, not, not overnight, but progressively, is the fact that uh, Donald Trump enjoys the lowest approval rating in the mid-30s as a percentage in his first uh, almost 100 days in office than any president in American history. Secondly, the same man, Do President Donald Trump, is obsessed with his image, his tough guy image of shooting from the hip, and uh, the constituency that he panders to, which is what I would call the colors of the American flag, red, white, and blue, rednecks, white supremacists, and blue-collar workers. 
Now, given that he, uh, you know, in terms of it, he, he is concentrating or would like to concentrate on America first and, and therefore domestic policies and trade policies, but the way the world is and the way the, the Americans project themselves as the policemen of the world and, in fact, as the sole superpower, there's no way he can avoid being embroiled in conflicts that are raging around the world, which is, some of which, in fact, America has started, some of which they have exacerbated. Middle East is an example. And therefore, I think being marginalized in Syria, with the Russians uh, being in the forefront of, of uh, you know, in, in terms of supporting the, uh, not, not only supporting the Bashar Assad regime, but being seen by the world as the major force fighting ISIS, which is supposed to be the American objective as well. And then on the Afghan scenario, again, there, it is now uh, arguably their longest war that they have fought, longer than Vietnam. And so in both instances, I think uh, the president, with his, with his host of senior officials, most of whom are from military backgrounds, whom he admires, uh, has to send a message that he is a tough guy, that America under him is not uh, to be pushed around, that America under him, particularly at a time, uh, you know, when he's being, he and his uh, uh, support staff during the elections are being investigated for Russian links and so on and so forth, that he is not a pushover for Russia. He is the president of the sole superpower. So the symbolism, has, there's no doubt, has been extremely important motive behind what he has done. Uh, whether it is a real signal that America is willing and able uh, to, to play the role of a superpower, a controlling role in, in um, conflicts like this, where lines are crossed which they don't like and therefore they will retaliate mm -hmm. massively, well, only time will tell. Because these two events I see, as of now, uh, as one-off events. You know, this business of an 11,000-ton bomb, uh, which is being dragged up in the air by a huge transport aircraft and vulnerable to anti-aircraft attacks, which has, which has to be thrown down with a parachute uh, and so on, uh, and in an area which is supposed to be full of tunnels and caves. Um, and at the end of it, a report that 36 IS fighters were killed. Who knows how many were killed? Who knows how many were not killed? Who knows right. how many were civilians right. or, or combatants? Uh, already, the Americans are investigating three episodes in Syria and Iraq and in Yemen, where the collateral damage to, to civilians was huge, much larger than before. Right. So it's a tangled web that the Americans have woven. They're caught up in it. Uh, I think he's definitely domestically uh, received some, some, some PR rewards for these two actions. But in terms of, uh, A, uh, putting America in the front line of, of forces that are fighting for peace and the peace process in either country, mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. doubt if it's done anything at all. Sure. Professor, now, so what, as far as America is concerned, you know, several advisors, several, you know, military generals have been continuously saying that America needs boots on the ground in Afghanistan, in Syria, and elsewhere. Is that what... Trump is going to look towards next. If uh, they put more boots on the ground, uh, that will be disastrous. He knows that very well. And I don't think that is going to be the, the step that is taken. Uh, you know, being a major player in global affairs in general and in, in the West Asian in South Asian region in particular, uh, that kind of uh, a message that is sent through the bombing of Syria. Earlier, they bombed uh, uh, Yemen. And then you have seen uh, uh, the damages done in Iraq, where lots of civilians died. And then now in Syria, and then um, Afghanistan. You could see the, the pattern. Uh, you know, academically speaking, the what uh, Dr. Vailavad was mentioning of that preemptive strike and so on, the kind of nation-state sovereignty-based international system that we have seen uh, earlier is broken through many, uh, you know, uh, uh, channels, particularly by these uh, preemptive strikes, interventions w uh, after the Cold War. And therefore, now nation-state borders are so porous for major actors to come in and do whatever they want. International legality, 
domestic laws, all those restrictions are now becoming more brittle. In that kind of a situation, these kinds of uh, air adventures are more easier to, easier route to take. Right. Uh, they are not concerned about the civilian damage, the infrastructural damage to the countries concerned, the, the uh, mammoth proportions of uh, human suffering and so on. And that human suffering is never an important element of international politics that does not become an important concern. What becomes a concern is what kind of strategies you adopt. But there is no Trump strategy asset. These are certain tactical measures taken by, advised by the military to, to do certain things. Uh, but they want to show it with a bang. Right. That I'm in the West Asian stage, I'm in the world stage, and, and so on and so forth. Fair so enough. Trump is sending that message. It, in a way, seems a continuation of Cold War politics uh, with a president who was saying the uh, things the other way around. Sure. Uh, you know, sending traditional kind of uh, Republican Party values of keeping the United States aloof from uh, world conflicts, developing it, and, and, and so on and so forth. So his own rhetoric at home that we have seen, in a way, is not totally absent also in the sense that that strong man within the United States, that kind of an image that he wants to project, now he could project that at the, at the global scale. Yes, scale. fair enough. You know, is this something, Alok Bansal, that's going to come back and haunt Donald Trump somewhere in, in the near future? See, uh, as Vailabad said, uh, there is a feasibility that he will not last his term. Uh, there are a lot of people who are speculating. Uh, I would not like to bet on it, actually. Uh, but the fact is that he's trying to project a persona which is bigger than life. And uh, what we are seeing is that the American foreign policy under Trump is going to be a knee jerk, a policy of knee jerk reaction and using a sledgehammer to kill a fly. Having said that, uh, if we look at American foreign policy, especially in Syria, it's been flawed right from the beginning. It's only towards the end of Obama administration that America was trying to get it right. Now, again, under Trump, it has again gone awfully wrong. As far as Afghanistan is concerned, uh, American policy has been a flip-flop. Uh, there was a time when they were trying to negotiate with Taliban, trying to look for good Taliban. Uh, no, these sort of policies do not work. Uh, to my mind, what he has done in Afghanistan is he's given a positive signal. Yes, we are going to stick here. And I think that's very important because there was a time when uh, Taliban would say that Americans may have the watches, but we have the time. They only had to outlast them. Uh, as far as this collateral damage is concerned, I think as far as Achin district of Nengarhar uh, is concerned, where this bomb has been dropped, this particular spot where it has been dropped, there were no civilian habitation. This was actually a cave complex. This has been held by ISIS for a very long period of time. The Afghan forces were not able to make advance uh, because there were uh, mines and physical barriers which they had car carried out. And I think that's why he, this particular spot has been chosen. Although in Afghanistan, Taliban is a bigger threat. But Taliban is interspersed with civilian population and a lot of places it would have not been feasible to do so. Incidentally, let me make it very clear, GBU 43B, which has been talked of and all media is, is not the largest ordinance available with the US. U US also has GBU 57, which is known as Bunker Buster, which is even bigger uh, bomb. But this is one of the largest, uh, at least the one which has been used to date, it's the largest. So to that extent, they have used it. But what is my biggest worry is that Syria, Afghanistan, now the way he's going about we could see a bigger problem with North Korea. And that is where uh, my fear is. Though, of course, North Korean regime, by any stretch of imagination, is a rogue regime. And I think it will require some amount of doctoring for anyone to actually support that sort of a regime. Uh, but uh, this sort of a knee-jerk reaction against North Korea, 
um, considering that they are equally mad, if not more, uh, could be catastrophic, actually. <laughs> that is where the problem is. Indeed, indeed. Well, Lawad, let's not talk about North Korea because I think everyone's spoken about North Korea and, and, and it looks like a very dangerous proposition to talk about North Korea right now. But let's talk about Russia. You know, uh, Alok was talking about the mother of all bombs. Now, Russia has come out and spoken about the father of all bombs, bombs, saying that we have a four times more powerful bomb yeah. than the, what the Americans have. So is this going to be the new discourse going forward? Like, you know, you're going to talk about muscle power between, Australia, uh, between the United States and Russia. I don't know why they call it mother or father. I don't know why they're bringing the father and the mother into the picture when they are really has nothing to do with the humanity in these issues. But the fact of the matter is that we are, the, the wider perspective picture is, it is a China, it is Russia, it is United States. United States is now militarization of Asia Pacific. They are doing it across the China next. Russia will be appeased by the American because the American administration cannot take two giants. So they have to separate the two. There is no question of reapproachment between Russia and China. So they may attack on Syria. This is actually because we have a military base of the Russian for the last 45 years. So they wanted to remove the foot of the Russian from the warm water of the Mediterranean. That's understood. They tried it in Crimea. Now they are trying here. In a similar fashion is in, a, in, in, in China. Now China is coming forward to fight against it, to any, uh, any kind of misadventure by the American administration in North Korea. That's a clear message that he is heating up the issues. The third part, which is more important, is testing ground. When we were in Afghanistan and Khusha Bahuddin in 2000 and we were covering, B-52 was used. B-52 was used and again they used it in Afghanistan, they used it in Iraq and then I, they used it in Libya. So now they are at the testing ground. You know the arm industry in the United States cannot sell you arms unless they do the testing for it. So is and this what it is? It, it is a testing ground. Okay. If basically forget about the human damage, collateral damage, this is infrastructure. You want to tell me that using the, the mother of all bomb according to them to kill 35 of IS? And according to our sources, United States, when they enter into Mosul, they siphoned 7,000 missionaries of IS into Afghanistan. They send them to Libya, they send them to Yemen, and they send them to, 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 to Syria. And according to the OPCW, that there are two factories left of manufacturing chemical. One was in Mosul, and one was in the resort. The okay. Syrian government was saying so last week, that there was an attack on by this American-led forces in the resort where chemicals have been released, but nobody talking about. Why? We have to ask the media, the new media order also, which is coming up, that they only give you the smear campaign to make a public opinion right. that to favor those nations who wanted to go for war and war I'm, I'm completely out of time. I'll take one closing comment in 30 seconds from you, Ambassador. Close the show for us. Well, uh, le le let's, let's focus then on what is important beyond just these specific events which is where do America and Russia go from here? Uh, you know, in the theater of conflict in, in the Middle East, all over the Middle East, as well as Afghanistan, in terms of uh, the Baltic states where NATO is shoring up its military presence, but only marginally, the fact is that uh, Russia-America relations are probably at their lowest point now since the Cold War. Right. And overall, uh, whether you look at it, uh, you know, and, and, and there's, of course, the elephant in the room, which is, which is China. So whichever way you look at it, there are extremely dangerous uh, scenarios which are at the moment playing out in the world. And everybody seems to be jockeying for... Uh, you know, for, for, for the pursuit of national interest in a sense which may be damaging to the interest of the world as a whole. Because All right. We'll have I to leave to that ambassador because we're really completely out of time. effort on the part of these two, plus China or the others, to really support a peace process. I mean, okay. it, it's been a farce. Fine, uh, fair enough. Fire All right. On that, that note, we'll have to call it a wrap. Wai Lawad, Shiv Shankar Mukherjee, A.K. Ramakrishnan, Alok Bansal, thank you so much, gentlemen for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. That's all the time we have today. See you again next time.